This happened back in 2014 with a few friends and I during the winter. I was 13 years old when this happened, and it's by far the creepiest and most dangerous situation I've ever been in. At the time, my family and I lived in a widely popular town of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Life was kind of like what you'd expect from Massachusetts. It snowed a lot and only got a bit warmer during the summer months. The winters here were almost brutal to the point where you wouldn't want to go outside, even with warm clothing. One day during the peak of winter, my school had closed due to the weather, and because of that, I had invited two of my friends over, Josh and Shane. They were around my age as well, with Shane being a little older, but still in the same range. We almost never have snow days, so we knew we had to make the most of it. We started playing some video games on the Xbox, all the way to eventually playing hide and go seek in the basement. My house has this really nice spacious basement that had all sorts of things like a pool table, a living room area, and even a mini theater. My parents were asleep upstairs and we didn't want to cause any noise. So the basement was the ideal place for us. We all decided that we'd play hide and seek to just pass the time. Seeing as to how big this basement was, we knew there would be plenty of places to hide. Josh and Shane would be doing the hiding, while I would be the one seeking. Once we started, I gave them a head start of 20 seconds to go pick a good hiding spot. As soon as I yell out the all too familiar, ready or not, here I come, I instantly began looking around the basement, searching every room and even closets. However, I wasn't able to find them. For whatever reason, I turned to my left towards the dark boiler room and turned on my flashlight from my phone to light my way. The boiler room light was broken, which my dad had yet to fix, even though we never used the boiler room. Upon entering, I notice a blue tarp covering something in the back of the room. The outline appeared to be a person, and that's when I knew I had finally found someone. I ever so slowly approached the tarp and remove it, expecting to see Shane or Josh hiding there. Instead, I was greeted to a dirty-looking man I had never seen before holding one of my dad's power drills. It took my mind a few seconds to process as to what I was seeing before running out of the room screaming. I then look back and see the man slowly get up and begin to follow me. Thankfully, however, I had slammed and locked the boiler room door shut so he wouldn't get out. Looking back, that was probably the smartest move I've ever done in a situation like that. This caused both my friends to come out of their hiding spots and ask me what was wrong. When I told them that there was a man hiding in the boiler room, they somewhat believed me as I was already distraught. That's when we all decide to book it upstairs and wake up my parents who were still asleep. My dad was clearly in a grumpy mood, but after I explained myself, he stormed down to the basement like a madman. I guess he must have found the guy as we heard a bunch of commotion going on in the boiler room. The fight was over within a short period of time due to my dad delivering several blows to the man's face. My dad had rushed my mom to call 911 while my dad had tied him up. My dad is ex-military, so he was not the type to allow anyone to pose a potential threat to our family. It took a little while before police got to my house, but they ended up arresting him. As the police were questioning him, he admitted to simply walking into my house through an unlocked door. The reason for this was because he just needed a warm place from the freezing cold. Whether his story was valid or not, I couldn't help but feel sympathy for him. Winter is the time of year where a lot of squatters seek shelter for warmth, and I'm still shocked that my house was targeted. He had also admitted that he had done this to several other homes, but had got away before he was caught. My dad had called all of my friend's parents to come and pick them up, as he was already uncomfortable as it is. I didn't get much sleep for a week after that and it was only after I had stayed with my grandma for a few days did I slowly begin to get over it. It wasn't until a few years after, where my dad and I were watching a movie about a home invasion. I'm not sure what the movie was called, but it reminded me of the incident, to which I brought it up to him. My dad sighed 
and said he had purposely left out an important detail that day. Apparently, as he had opened the door to the boiler room, the man had been standing there and had attempted to use the drill to harm him, and this resulted in my dad throwing punches at him. The reason he never told me this was because I was too young, and that he didn't want to scare me more. It was then when I had realized that if I had opened the door again, he probably would have tried to kill me. I was a small 13-year-old boy, so there was no way I could have taken him on, especially with a power drill. The last I heard, he was taken to a mental hospital after being released from prison. While this all was a terrifying situation, I just hope he's getting the help he needs. For starters, I'm a 29-year-old female and currently live in upstate New Jersey with my fiancé Brian. We had just bought a nice one-story home in the suburbs after finally moving out of my parents' house. The house wasn't anything too fancy, just your typical American-style house appropriate for a couple like us. This happened during the winter of 2021, when the pandemic was still in effect. My fiancé and I had gotten jobs as software engineers and would constantly work long hours into the day. On this particular day, I had been off from work, so I took this time to just have a nice day to myself. It was mid-December, and the news had reported heavy snowfall in the area, which made for a perfect setting. At some point during the day, I had decided to take our dog, Crayon, out for a walk along the trails by the park. We never really took him outside all that much, so I decided to give him some freedom. Crayon is a fox-faced Pomeranian, the perfect comfort dog for any household. By this point, it was snowing pretty hard, and I wanted to make the walk quick so him nor me would get too cold. New Jersey during the dead of winter was beyond freezing, and you only went out when you really had to. That, or you simply loved freezing your ass off. In this case, I was out for both reasons, and I grew up in the cold, so I was used to it to say the least. As I'm walking him by the tree line, he stops in the snow and perks his ears up facing the direction by some dense brush. In a playful tone, I ask him, do you smell something, boy? Assuming he saw a small critter, like a lizard or something. That's when he begins to get nervous and starts barking at something in the woods. However, his barks weren't the annoying slash normal barks. These seemed more out of control, as if he had felt threatened by something. I turned to the woods, staring into the thicket, but I couldn't see or hear anything except for the sound of wind and snow falling. At this point, Crayon is going absolutely insane, running in circles, screaming, and even pissing himself. It was almost as if something had been attacking him, and that he was trying to get away. This was clearly an indication that there was something, or someone watching us, that he could see, but I couldn't. That's when I begin to feel this negative energy, and I pick up Crayon and run back to the house. Thought for sure that there was definitely something back there, and that whatever it was, was going to follow me. Tried to run in the snow, even though the blankets of the snow had slowed me down. Needless to say, we get back, and Crayon seemed to have calmed down, but was on full alert. All the while, my mind is trying to process as to what the hell just happened, and why he went so berserk. I didn't bother telling my fiancé about it, or anyone else, fearing they'd think I'm crazy, but would you blame them? We've walked him out on that trail several times, and nothing close to this has ever happened. The worst thing that's happened while walking him was him nearly getting into a fight with another dog. That's it. We still take Crayon out on some walks here and there, but I always remember to use a different path. As for my fiancé, I just tell him that Crayon gets nervous around there. I still have theories as to what really happened on that day, though there isn't much evidence to back it up. My most common theory was that there was someone hiding in the woods that I couldn't see, which caused my dog to freak out. The other theory was that there was some sort of entity or energy in the woods, which made my dog visibly anxious. 
Part of me wants to believe this theory, and the other part of me doesn't. Dogs can see things us humans can't, but I know for sure. It's just crazy to me that there are things in this world that we can't quite fully comprehend. Back in 2017, I worked as a delivery driver for Uber Eats to make some extra money on the side. It wasn't the best paying job, but it was something to help me get by my struggles as a growing adult. I was 25 years old, and I'm sure most of you know how life really sets in at that age. Anyway, I live in the suburbs of New York. Not the city, just the state, as I was never a city person, but lived near it. Throughout my life, I've always been more of a quiet person, which is why I really like the suburban areas. One night, I was doing some late night delivery orders to keep the income flowing when there had been an incoming weather report. The snow had been falling pretty hard, and the winds were measuring well over 50 kilometers, and that a blizzard was on its way. That being said, I still wanted to do a few more orders for the night. Luckily, I had received one order from someone on the other side of town. It wasn't too far, but this person barely met the delivery radius. I was annoyed because of the distance, but I realized it was another tip. I bit my lip and drove to the restaurant and to the given address. All the while, the falling snow began to come down fast and the winds were starting to pick up. On top of that, the snow on the sidewalks were already starting to pile up, so I knew I had to get there in time. I arrive at the destination, and there's this man standing outside of his terrace house wearing several layers of clothing. Just by looking at him, he did not seem like a pleasant type of man. It was one of those men that screamed stranger danger. He comes up to my car, and I proceed to hand him his food when he begins to ask for some money. I ask him what it was for, to which he then says that his car had been out of gas. Okay, so I wasn't sure why that was my problem, but being nice and not wanting to piss him off, I hand him a $10 bill and wished him luck. He looked down at the money and then looked back at me with a blank expression as if he wanted more. He then said that it wasn't enough and that it could at least do 50. I told him that was all I had but that maybe someone else could help him. The look on his face that day is something that will never leave me. It was a look of hatred and anger, as if I were his sworn enemy. Then tell him to enjoy, and drove off away from the building. Doing that, however, was probably the most stupidest decision of my life. I hear two loud bangs echo through the streets along with something hitting my back tire. It didn't take me long to realize that these bangs were actually gunshots. Suddenly, my car swerves from left to right, and the ice didn't make it any better. Eventually, I managed to get a hold of the wheel and drive back with my back tire making this awful noise. However, I was afraid of what might happen if I stopped my car, in case he was following me somehow. Thankfully, I had gotten home safely just in time, and didn't once look back. Police were called, and I reported the incident to Uber, but nothing ever became of it. After all, this did happen in the Bronx, which isn't the safest place in the city. I guess I learned my lesson not to assume that everything I do is safe, when in reality, it isn't. About five years ago, my mom started dating a guy that she'd met on a dating site. The online dating is fine. I had recently started dating a woman who would later become my wife, and we'd met online as well. Both my girlfriend, who would later become my wife, and myself never liked this guy. We thought he was a weirdo literally from day one. We didn't think he was mean or anything like that. Just creepy. He was quiet. He kept his eyes closed a lot, occasionally saying odd things, like offering my wife a chocolate, then popping one in his mouth and closing his eyes, then moaning as he let it melt in his mouth. It was all stuff that just teetered on inappropriate, but also kind of reminded me of special needs individuals I've personally known as well in my life. 
I don't mean that in a disparaging way in the slightest, just in the sense that I wondered how much control this guy had over his thoughts and his words. One time my wife and I were visiting my mom, but she got called into work, so we waited at her house. Her boyfriend was over, and he spent the entire several hours that night just hanging out in her bedroom with the door closed. We could hear noises every now and again, but for the most part, it sounded like he was just lying totally still in there. It really creeped us out, because we didn't know what to do. We ended up just waiting it out, but maybe he'd be a little bit more of a host next time. Just before Christmas, my mom and this guy start having some difficulties. My wife and I were visiting for the holidays. She dropped all of her problems on us, and we listened carefully, gave our opinions, and suggested that she might be better off without him. She had already made her mind up, though, and decided to break up with him on Christmas Eve. I couldn't help but smile. Of course, she'd been lying out this entire plan, down to the day of when to do it, and then explained it to us purely for confirmation. What I was smiling about was that she'd already lured us into the house for the holiday weekend. We're going to be stuck in the crossfire after she dumps this guy. All I can imagine is him quietly collecting his belongings before murdering us in our sleep. Thanks, Mom. We spent the night at my mom's and got up early on Christmas morning to visit my dad at his house. We didn't plan to spend the night at my dad's, but we got snowed in, which was actually a nice Christmas surprise. We had avoided the entire breakup conversation the night before and then got out of there pretty much the moment the sun rise and we were happy to be now stuck at my dad's. The next day, we left as soon as we could, to get through the snow. My wife suggested that we stop by my mom's house on the way, and make sure that she was okay. My wife just had a really bad feeling about that ex-boyfriend. I couldn't blame her. That whole weekend was like a perfect murder setup. It was a holiday weekend, fresh blankets of snow, family members coming and going adding to the chaos. With my mom and that guy snowed in alone, the reality became more clear that there was potentially danger at hand. My mom's car was in the driveway, but that doesn't really mean much. She lives close enough to work that she actually walks often. She never locks her door, which drives me crazy, so we let ourselves in. That's when we see blood oozing out of the refrigerator's water dispenser. It had filled up the spill container and was leaking onto the floor and made this giant puddle. My wife screamed, and I freaked out. I fully expected to see my mom's head in the freezer. The house is caught in this eerie half-light. No sound or movement. There doesn't seem to be anyone around. I holler both of their names into the house and get no response. Sour pit is churning in my stomach, and I'm starting to really entertain the idea that the worst has happened. It's not hard to do when you're seeing exactly what you didn't want to see. I nervously opened the freezer to find a bag of frozen cherries that had been opened, crammed into the freezer so that it fell onto the ice dispenser, and then melted. My mom turned out to be in the shower just warming up. Ex-boyfriend was nowhere to be found. We told her about the cherry incident, to which she gave us this funny look and asked us to show her. She claimed she'd never even bought frozen cherries. Didn't have any. Those weren't hers. We think the ex-boyfriend bought them, opened them, and then arranged them in the freezer so they'd thaw and drip, like a weird, ominous power move. For Dayton, Ohio, Christmas time of 1992 would become synonymous with a group whose name would haunt the city for many, many years to come the downtown posse, since their meeting during a night of drinking just two weeks prior, 22-year-old Marvelous King and his 16-year-old girlfriend, Laura Taylor, had been inseparable. Laura had recently been kicked out of her parents' house. She had no job and had quickly become financially dependent on Marvelous, who had burned through what little cash she had keeping her entertained. Around two weeks before Christmas, the couple spent the last of their cash on a single night's stay in a downtown Dayton hotel and were desperate for money. 
Fortunately, Laura had an idea. She knew a man named Joseph Wilkerson, who had a rather lucrative job at General Motors. A man who spent a sizable amount of his disposable income on sexual deviancy. The plan was simple. Laura would call Joseph and invite him to an orgy in exchange for a sizable amount of cash. Once they knew he had the cash on hand, they could get into his home with the help of a fellow member, Heather Matthews, and rob him. But the raid turned into something far more horrific than a simple smash and grab. On Christmas Eve, once marvelous, Heather and Laura had forced their way into Joseph's home at 3321 Prescott Avenue. They tied him to bed with electrical cord, torturing him until he gave up the cash. But once the money was secured, Marvelous used a 32 caliber Derringer to execute their victim, so he couldn't report them to the police. After the murder, the trio made themselves at home, raiding Joseph's fridge and playing loud music before stealing his car, which now facilitated their killing spree. What came next can only be described as a frenzy of violence. The next victim was Danita Gallet, who was shot multiple times while using a payphone at 517 Neal Avenue. There was no plan this time. It seemed like they just shot a totally random person in the middle of the street, before jumping out of a stolen car and taking her shoes, jacket, and a backpack. After they were apprehended by the police, the surviving members of the downtown Paws would admit that the sole motivation for Danita's cold-blooded murder was to steal her brand new sneakers. The third victim that night was a man named Jeffrey Wright, who was shot four times while standing outside of 157 Yuma Place. Thankfully, he was lucky enough to survive the attack, but as it turned out, Jeffrey had a personal connection to the group. He was the ex-boyfriend of Heather Matthews, who was, by that time, in a relationship with another downtown bus member, Demarcus Smith, and it was he who pulled the trigger four times, hitting Jeffrey in both legs. Fortunately, he was able to escape to a neighbor's house and get himself some medical assistance. The downtown pause then rested for the night, but planned on resuming their spree the very next day. As the sun set on Christmas Day 1992, the group had decided on their next victim, a man named Richard Maddox, and he too had a connection to the Paz. He was Laura Taylor's ex-boyfriend, who was lured from his parents' house with the promise of reconciliation. He picked her up in his car, and the pair then drove around discussing their past relationship. But unbeknownst to Richard, the rest of the downtown paws followed close behind. Richard soon figured out that he was being tailed. He grew nervous and attempted to make a quick getaway. And that's when Laura put the Derringer pistol to his head and pulled the trigger, killing him instantly. Then, as the car was about to crash, Laura threw herself out of the moving vehicle and was then picked up by the fellow gang members. On the following day, Sarah Abraham was working at the family-owned shortstop mini-market on West 5th Street when the Puz entered the store. Once again, Laura Taylor seemed to be leading the group and selecting their victims, scouting ahead and entering the store first to ensure that they would not be overwhelmed or outnumbered. She was followed by Demarcus and Marvelous, who shot Sarah in the face before wounding a customer who was just picking up groceries. Sarah would survive for five days in the hospital, but eventually she would succumb to the complications stemming from those wounds. Immediately following that short stop shooting, the Puzz made their way to Sillam Avenue, where they found a woman airing up her tires at a gas station. As soon as the woman saw them approaching with guns drawn, she fled. But it wasn't this that saved her life. It later came to light that Laura Taylor had demanded that Marvelous shoot her as soon as she ran. But he hesitated, and the woman was able to make her escape. It's a highly disturbing detail that the youngest and seemingly most innocent of the four was evidently the most bloodthirsty. The Puzz then stole the woman's black Dodge Shadow, the same car that was pulled over in a traffic stop that led to their arrest. In the aftermath of them being apprehended, the group told the police where to find two more bodies, those of Wendy Cottrell and Marvin Washington. Their bodies were at the city-owned gravel dump, 
located at 1654 Richley Drive. These two were members of the PUS that Laura Taylor ordered the execution of because she believed they knew too much and would break under police pressure. They told the two soon-to-be victims they all wanted to party and told them to get in the car. A short while later, Marvelous pulled the car over into the gravel pit, ordered Wendy and Marvin to get out, and then he and Demarcus shot them in cold blood. It's terrifying that the downtown paws quickly went from killing for financial gain to just killing for the thrill of it. And all during the most festive time of the year, when families of the victims would have been extra devastated to learn their loved ones' demise given that Christmas is such a family-oriented holiday. Perhaps the only solace we can take in this case is to learn that Marvelous Keen was executed for his part in the murders, and the families of the victims managed to get some measure of justice. I was invited to a party on New Year's Eve, and a couple that are my friends were invited too. Since the guy knew the way to the party, and I didn't and they live about 20 minutes from me driving, I gave them a ride. It was a nice party with 15 friends, and we spent the night okay. But in the morning, even though that our friend had told us we could sleep at his house and drive home when we woke up, we still decided it was time to go home. This was around 5. 30 a.m. I drank only a bit of champagne so I could drive, and both my friends from the couple drank almost nothing since they were spending the next day with the girl's family, and didn't want to be hung over, so we were sober when this happened. We said our goodbyes and got out of the house. We know that the area is known for having pretty sketchy characters, but the car was a two-minute walk from the house and we didn't expect to get in trouble. We were wrong. So as we got out of the house, there was this one guy just standing in the middle of the parking lot, smoking what smelled like weed. We walk on the opposite side of the road to this guy, but he starts messing with my girlfriend. She's really pretty so guys usually stare and she's used to it, but this guy starts making infelicitous comments to her with her obvious boyfriend, my friend, that has his arm around her right there. We look at him but say nothing since we are right next to the car when he starts walking towards us. So we get in and I quickly lock the doors and drive away fast before he can catch up to us. But since that town was unknown to us and big, we had to stop and turn the GPS on. After we do this, we get on the road, but immediately have to stop at a red light. The car stops right next to us, which would be normal if it wasn't like 5 or 45 a.m. We look at it, and that creepy guy is inside, staring at us. At this time we started commenting that he probably saw our car stopped and was waiting for us to ride away, but we didn't want to freak out so we just kept looking forward and kept driving thinking we were probably overreacting and that this guy could just be going the same way as us. But as the drive continues, we get on the highway, so does the guy and he is obviously stalking us. When I speed up, he speeds up. When I slow down, he slows down. Even pretended I was going to leave the highway in one exit and quickly return to the main highway road, and he copied that exact same move. We start freaking out but keep driving as me and the girl's boyfriend try to calm her down, saying there are two of us and only one of him who is very lightly high. We are not that huge, I'm like 5'9". 140 pounds and her boyfriend is like 5'10", 154 pounds and the guy besides being tall was really skinny too and we were just afraid of how crazy he was, crazy enough to stalk us. 40 minutes of stalking later we get out of the highway so I can take them home, but I stop two streets away from my girlfriend's house and the car stops behind us, making her boyfriend jump out of the car and me following him. I wouldn't let him be alone. We don't know how crazy that guy is, and I have a really heavy bat in my car, which I take with me. It's forbidden to have this kind of thing in cars in my country, but whatever, I have it anyway for protection. As we start approaching the car, he quickly speeds up making a U-turn and driving away, back for the highway, or so we thought. My friends take their stuff and say they can make the walk home. It's about three minutes. 
going between the buildings and avoiding the roads. So we say our goodbyes and I get back to the car and start driving to the highway to get home. As I make the U-turn to get close to the highway I see that creepy guy's car waiting there and he starts following me again, probably thinking my girlfriend is still there. Now I freak out a little bit more, I'm alone, and even if I have the bat in the car, I don't know what this guy has and his. So we get on the highway, and I start driving normally pretending I didn't see him. And the second I see two huge trucks in front of me I speed up and between them. At this time I'm driving around 87 miles per hour, looking at my rearview mirror to see if I'm losing the guy my exit appears and I take it I get off the main road into a side road from where I can see the highway, and stop there I turn off the car lights and look at the highway, and see that guy's car get off of the highway, but quickly getting back. On a guess I really lost him, and he just got out and re-entered because the place where I live is the last exit where the highway is free of charge. Calm down and drive home all the way looking, behind my shoulder nothing really happened, but my greatest fear was for my friend and for me after I was alone.